press that one. Excellent. Okay, so thank you for everybody who's um, who's joined us this morning um, for another one of the Instant Theme One seminars. Um, and I'm really pleased this morning to um, be able to introduce Quentin Daladin um, from uh, UC Levan in Belgium. Um, and quentin has been doing some fantastic work over the last few years looking at data assimilation um, and really interesting ways in which you can combine the models and the paleoclimate records. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the new work that he's been doing. So over to you, Quentin. Thank you, Liz. So hello, everyone. Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to present my work. And so as we said today, I'm going to talk about uh, on what I've been working on past years and my current work, in particular, how we can reconstruct the Antarctic climate over the past centuries using bioclimate records and climate trough uh, data simulation. Um, so first, I would like to present myself. Uh, I'm a Bazin researcher working in the team of uh, Ugos, who also supervise uh, my thesis. And the team um, of the thesis was already focused on the past Antarctic hydroclimate, with a particular attention to snow accumulation. And I'm still very interested in understanding historical changes in the Antarctic hydroclimate, but not only snow accumulation, but also atmospheric situation and uh, sea ice cover, for instance. And for that, I use a variety of information, especially paleoclimate records such as ice core, tree rings, but also uh, more recently, uh, coral records. And along with uh, the paleoclimate records, I also make use of available um, global climate model simulation. And to combine these two sources of information, I apply data simulation uh, methods. So as I said, the goal of the presentation is to present my work on reconstructing the Antarctic hydroclimate over the past uh, centuries using paleoclimate records and climate models. Uh, now, a couple of years ago, Nathan Seeger and uh, collaborators published uh, a reconstruction of global hydroclimate over the common era. And the purpose uh, of the reconstruction was first to reconstruct changes in the global hydroclimate, such as drought, but also to understand why do changes happen in the past? And here we aim at doing something very similar, but focus on the, on the Antarctic hydroclimate, which was not uh, the aim uh, of the, the main interest of the Nathan uh, study. So, um, we are therefore uh, interested in the reason uh, behind climate changes in the Antarctic hydroclimate. So in addition to reconstruct a variable such as temperature or snow accumulation, we also uh, reconstruct dynamical variables such as atmospheric circulation to understand why these changes happen. And moreover, looking at changes at longer time scale, so past centuries, will allow us to determine if the observed changes over the satellite air, for instance, are part of longer uh, term changes. And uh, I will also present a case study where we aim at investigating the role played by tropical variability in the West Antarctic climate over the past uh, centuries, especially over the last uh, centuries. And lastly, the motivation of this works is to get long-term uh, historical changes of Antarctic um, hydroclimate. And with such long uh, time series, we can examine if these changes are due to human activities or not. So in order to know what uh, looked like the past climate, we need to rely on indirect observation, that's um, paleoclimate record. And these records give insight into past environmental conditions. And in Africa, as you may probably all know, the most famous paleoclimate archives are ice cores. And therefore, ice core records provide historical changes of um, the past climate. For instance, here I display the water isotope, um, isotopic content of an ice core 
uh, drill uh, at uh, Gomez in South Peninsula. And this record long of 150 euros indicates a stronger surface running in South Peninsula over the past decades. And more recently, uh, we observe a growing interest in um, ice core snow accumulation records. Again, here in the paper of, uh, of Lee's in uh, 2015, they showed that South Peninsula and eastern part of uh, West, Ant West Antarctic ice sheet have witnessed a snow accumulation increase. And according to the three ice core analyzed in this study, the increase has started around the beginning of the 20th century. In, in 2017, an important effort has been made to gather all the available ice core records, in particular uh, Delta 18 and uh, snow accumulation records. This has been done by the PGS 2K Antarctic 2K Working Group and resulted in two database of one uh, of more than 100 um, records for Delta 18 and around 80 for snow accumulation. And most of um, these records span the last uh, centuries, and most of them are located in West Antarctica. However, ASCO records provide uh, local information on past climate where the core has been drilled. And although a strong effort has been made uh, over the past decade to get more and more records, the special resolution distribution is still uh, sparse. So we, we need a method to get the full spatial structure of changes uh, from the local information uh, given by Icecore. And to provide a complete spatially distribution of uh, changes, there are some uh, methods that uh, use the local information to infer the continental way a wide change. So in other words, uh, to get the, the full spatial uh, picture of uh, the change. And for instance, here uh, for snow accumulation, Pukmenle and uh, Lise uh, provided a snow accumulation book solution over the last two centuries by combining high score snow accumulation records and atmospheric analysis. And they show that the Antarctic snow accumulation, uh, so the changes over the last uh, centuries are highly viable in space, both in sign and magnitude. And this recognition gives insight into uh, spatial changes in snow accumulation over the last centuries, but it doesn't provide information on the explanation of those uh, changes. So it doesn't say anything on the reason, the explanation why we observe a change, neither on the dynamics that cause the change. So um, to fully understand the physical reasons, the dynamics of the changes, we need another approach. And this approach is the, the modeling approach. By including all the components of the climate systems, so the atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, but also land ice, climate model simulates the whole um, climate dynamics and are thus ideal to understand the dynamics of climate change. However, in contrast with ice core records, and more generally paleoclimate records, climate models are not constrained by observation. They are forced by historical forcing, natural and anthropogenic. But the main advantage of a climate model is that by providing, uh, they provide a um, complete uh, special field of any variables. So we can understand why changes have occurred and what are the dynamical explanation of um, climate change. So climate models, uh, give information on what could um, have happened in the past, but not what it really happened because they are not constrained by observation. So models can be seen as a tool to verify hypotheses drawn from a paleoclimate uh, observation. So from one side, uh, we have high score records which give information on timing of changes, but at the local scales. So for instance, snow accumulation and the 18. And 
from the other side, the climate models include all the physics of the climate models and provide all the special fields for any variables, such as temperature and precipitation, but also winds and sea ice cover to understand the changes. However, the timing of changes is not included in the climate models, at least for the global climate models without uh, data estimation. So the two uh, sources are complementary, and it would be wonderful if we could combine them. <coughs> Sorry. And hopefully, data estimation is exact, exactly what we need since this method combines information from observation, in our case, paleoclimate records and the physics of climate models. And to make it very simple, data estimation aims at spreading the information for paleoclimate variables into space, but also to reconstruct other variables thanks to the climate physics of climate model. Um, so the climate model in data estimation is used to spread the local information from paleoclimate records in space by relying on the spatial covariance. And in addition, is also, um, it also allows us to reconstruct non-assimilated variables such as atmospheric segregation or sea ice cover. And this is possible thanks to the model covariance between uh, variables. For instance, if there, uh, there is a strong relationship between the assimilated uh, variables and the variables that we want to reconstruct, we can expect a good reconstruction for these variables too. So with data estimation, reconstructing the climate uh, variables that cannot be directly observed is possible. Another um, advantage of data estimation is that we have a dynamical consistency in the reconstructed uh, variables since we rely on the climate dynamics provided by the climate model. And finally, data estimation uh, takes into account quite naturally the uncertainty associated with the proxy. So how the data estimation uh, works in uh, practice. The data estimation method that we use uh, in uh, the group is a uh, particle filter. We start with the, the best initial guess, which is drawn uh, from available climate model estimation. Is it called uh, the prior and contain all the variable that we assimilate, but also the one that we want to reconstruct. For instance, if we assimilate ice core snow motion record, we put um, in that vector all the snow accumulation states for the model ensemble, plus all the variables that we want to reconstruct, for instance, the level pressure. And the particle filter aims at updating the first get, so the prior, depending on the available observation. In practice, um, we often consider the recognition as the weighted mean of the model state depending on the weight, but the final recognition is rather an ensemble such a, uh, like the prior. And the weight to each model state is directly computed as the likelihood with the available observation. Higher is the likelihood, higher is the weight. And in contrast with other methods, the particle filter doesn't change the physics of the climate model, but only the way to each model state to update the prior. So let's take uh, an example. The climate model simulation is represented here by the black line on the figure. And let's say um, this is the first year with able uh, proxy observation. We sample a certain number <coughs> sorry, of model states in the climate model simulation. Here uh, we, we took 10, but in practice, this is far more, for instance, uh, three dozen. And these in independent model states are called particles and are represented by the gray cycle. They form the prior state of the climate system 
the first guest of the state of the climate system covering the whole range of values. Just a glass of water. <clears throat> and on the other end, we have the distribution of the available proxy observation with associated uncertainties at each tempted. And here is represented by the blue curve. And before the assimilation, all uh, the particles, so the model state, have the same weight, which um, is proportional to the size of the circle. So each particle represents a state of the climate system, which means that they include all the climate variables in the model. And for each particle, we evaluate its likelihood likelihood with the available observation. And based on this likelihood, the weight of each particle is updated. So it's the weighting. And at the end, we just have a posterior distribution of the particle with an update weight for this curve. Um, let's take um, a concrete um, example of how local information can be spread in space. Here I represented the temporal correlation between the local snow emission at uh, the birth station presented by the yellow star and the snow emission for uh, Antarctica in the prior. Where uh, there is a significant uh, correlation, whether positive or negative, there is a potential to reconstruct the snow equation from this local record. For example, here, all around the station, the correlation is high, which means that the snow accumulation at this station is representative of the uh, area all around. And in addition to spreading uh, the local information space, the information can also be propagated uh, to other variables, thanks to the covariance between the assimilated variables and the other variables given by um, the model, so the prior. For example, here on the left, the temporal correlation between local snow accumulation still at birth station, and um, the temperature uh, in Antarctica. And on the right, with the atmospheric circulation, 500 hectopascal. And where uh, there is a large uh, covariance, we can expect to correctly reconstruct other variables than those which are assimilated. And here is a clear example showing a strong relationship between uh, surface temperature and snow accumulation. And on the right, we can see that ice core snow accumulation uh, we got located at burst uh, station can be very helpful for constructing the emergency law. And therefore, the quality of reconstructed uh, variables depend on the covariance between uh, variables in the prior. If uh, there is a strong relationship between assimilated variables and the one that we want to reconstruct, we can ex expect a good skill for the reconstituted variables. And therefore, all the variables are not reconstituted uh, with the same confidence. It's related to the covariance uh, structure. If the relationship between the assimilated uh, proxy at the specific location and the field of interest is uh, weak, we cannot hope to get a good resolution for these variables. And obviously, with more and more proxy, uh, you just better constrain the climate. So to sum up, um, data simulation um, uh, providing the best climate state depending on the information provided by assimilated records, here the paleoclimate records, and the information on the timing of change come from uh, the proxy, while the propagation into space and variables come from the model. And so that assumption find the best estimate uh, to fit uh, at the best the two sources of information, proxy and climate models. So I have done uh, with the explanation on the data estimation uh, method. I would like uh, 
now to, to present the first case study. And in this uh, case study, we aim at uh, better understanding the past surface climate uh, change in the West Antarctic uh, sector. And as you probably know, West Antarctica is a region where large changes have occurred over the past decade, with, for instance, a large widespread warning, including a strong warning over uh, the peninsula. The overall snow accumulation increase has mitigated the 20th um, century sea level rise. At the ocean surface, important changes have been also observed with contrast construct uh, regional changes since we observe sea ice extent decrease in the Belling uh, Ocean Sea, but also in Weddell, while for Wasi we, um, we observe a sea ice uh, extent increase. So in this study, um, we investigate the role uh, of the atmospheric circulation, in particular, the role of the Amundsen uh, silo. And also, to examine if the observed changes so over the satellite IRA are part of long-term changes. And this is done by reconstructing the West Antarctic surface uh, changes over the past centuries. As paleoclimate records, we assimilate all the available uh, annual data weighting and snow accumulation records, plus the trimming width uh, located in the mid latitude, and we include uh, this uh, mid latitude records just to guarantee large scale uh, coherence. And as you can see on the map, um, the West Antarctic and mostly the Pacific sector has a lot of records. Um, it's also worth noting that most of the, of the available records span the past two centuries. Ice core record uh, can be directly compared with the output of the climate models. Why for trimming uh, record, we use a univariate and bivariate uh, regression to convert this record into climate variables that can be assimilated or directly uh, compared with the, the, the output of the model, like temperature or precipitation. For building our prior, we use um, the available last millennium ensemble performed with the isotope enabled uh, community or system model, the first version. And this simulation offers us to build a large uh, prior with more than uh, 3,000 model states. So, with this large ensemble, we can expect to cover a large range of climate variability and therefore to find a good match between the assimilated record and model state. We also choose these models because it explicitly simulates the water isotope. Therefore, we don't need to convert ice code authority in records into temperature, for instance, as usually done. And in addition, uh, we have the chance that um, this model is one of the best Earth system models at simulating the Antarctic uh, climate. And since we strongly rely on the spatial structure uh, and the covariance between variables, using a model that well represents the Antarctic climate variety is uh, essential as the model's very crucial role in the final reconstruction. Uh, according to the comparison with the era 5 analysis, here this predicts the correlation coefficient between our recognition and the analysis. The comparison indicates that the asymmetric variables, so snow accumulation and temperature, are well reconstituted. Oh, I said temperature, but it's rather delta 18. And moreover, by assimilating uh, high score and proving records, we are also able to reconstruct the sea level pressure, in particular the Amundsen Silo, and the CI concentration in the West Antarctic uh, sector. And in fact, we obtain a um, high value for both correlation coefficient and coefficient of efficiency. 
for the Amundsen silo and sea extent uh, in the West uh, Antarctic sector. So our reconstruction can be therefore used to infer uh, past changes beyond the satellite uh, error. And having historical changes of the Amundsen silo is crucial as is a major control of the West Antarctic climate variability, both on the continent and at uh, the ocean surface, but also at the subsurface, as highlighted by several studies, since the Amundsen sea low partly controlled the melting of ice shell. According um, to our reconstruction, the Amundsen sea low has deepened over the last centuries, and our results show that the deepening has started around um, 1940. And before that, the Amundsen silo was quite stable during one century, still with uh, quite important uh, multidecadal fluctuation. And what about uh, changes in uh, sea ice? Our resolution indicate that the sea ice extent in the billing Ocean Sea has decreased 20 years after the beginning of the industrial era, sorry, and therefore um, that the therefore the observed sea ice decrease um, over the satellite era is part of a long-term changes started one century and a half uh, ago. In contrast, sea extent in the West Sea didn't vary a lot over the, the past two centuries and only started increasing around um, 1940, like the Amundsen sea low. And why do we observe a contrasted uh, change in a sea, uh, sea extent? Since our resolution includes all the climate uh, variables that may influence the sea ice variability, we can analyze the other variables. Here are displayed the linear trend for a 50 years period of the past two centuries for the 500 hectopascal geotensile 8, 700 hectopascal air temperature, and the sea ice concentration. The first period um, is the only period where we observe a sea ice extent decrease in the Belling Ocean Sea. And this period is characterized by a weakening of the Amundsen Sea low. And this atmospheric secretion blows cold uh, air from the continent to the Belling Ocean uh, Sea. So, sorry, we, for this period, we notice a sea increase. And so this situation explains why we have more uh, sea ice in that uh, sector. For the last period, we have more or less the opposite situation with a straining of the Amundsen sea low. This atmospheric secretion enhances warm air to the Billing Ocean Sea. This turn explaining the sea extent decrease. And in contrast, a deeper Amundsen sea low is associated with sea extent increase in the Rossi, since it, it ends the cold air flow from the continent. For the two um, other periods, we rather observe a weakening of the Amundsen sea low, albeit much less uh, large than for the first period. And normally, this situation is associated with sea ice extent expansion in the Belling Ocean Sea, which is not observed in our reconstruction. And on the contrary, sea ice extent in Ross is quite well explained by the atmospheric circulation pattern. And therefore, our reconstruction could suggest that sea ice extent in the Belling Ocean Sea is less related to the atmospheric secretion than for sea ice extent in Wasi. So sea ice extent in Belling Ocean uh, Sea could be more influenced by thermodynamic processes, general processes, as temperature 
um, as temperature uh, since the beginning of the industrial era has rise in that sector according to our reconstruction. So now uh, I would like to move to the second uh, study case where we look at the role of topical variability in the West Antarctic uh, sector. Over the past uh, year and the uh, yeah, last decade, numerous studies suggested that the tropical variability, in particular uh, the tropical uh, Pacific, may account for changes in the West Antarctic uh, climate. So here we are interested in quantifying the role of tropical variability in the 20th century surface climate change. And moreover, we want to identify if this relationship between the two regions depends on the time scale or not. For instance, is the internal relationship the same as the century time scale relationship? To answer uh, this question, we added coral records in our data simulation. And there are about um, 80 records most of them are located in the Pacific sector, which is a good thing for us. And like uh, the other records, most of them span the past two uh, centuries. When evaluating our new resolution, so with the, um, the coral records, when we compare with observation, assimilating coral records generally improve the the quality of the reconstruction compared with the previous reconstruction uh, that only use high score and trimming records. We particularly improve the reconstruction for sea ice extents in the Ross and Weddell Sea. And in addition, the main tropical Pacific mode of IBT, uh, such as PDO or uh, the IPO, are also well reconstructed. So the work solution is um, ideal for studying the role of tropical variability on the Antarctic climate variability. Here, um, I compare the 20th century trend in sea level pressure in three data simulation experiments. The first one only used high score and trimming with records, the first work solution, let's say. The second, only the coral records, so the, the, the added value of coral records. And the last one, we use all the records. And we see that the deepening of the MNC and silo is only observed when high score and trimming width are included in the data simulation. This suggests that tropical variability cannot explain the deepening of the MNC silo over the last century. If you look at the specific trend over the last centuries, we indeed observe that coral records are not associated with a deepening of the MNC silo. In addition, uh, data simulation experiment only using coral records present a sea ice extent decrease for all the sector. So tropical variability might explain the sea ice extent decrease in Bellingosan and Weddell Sea, but not the sea ice extent increase in Ross. And this could be explained uh, by the fact that sea ice extent in uh, the in Ross Sea is largely um, controlled by the deepening of the Munsan Silo, which is not reconstructed in the coral experiment. In addition to the data simulation uh, observation, we also make use of uh, two ensembles of climate model simulation that cover the last uh, century. The first ensemble is forced by the historical forcing, here represented in black, while the second one, um, the sea surface temperature in the tropical Pacific is nudged to the model and is represented in red. And by calculating the contribution of the unforced variability of the tropical variability of the tropical um, Pacific uh, variability, by computing the difference between the two ensembles, so E represented in green, we see that um, 
the unforced viability uh, of, the, of the tropics, the Pacific, uh, the Pacific, the Pacific tropics, um, cannot explain the recent changes in the deepening of the Amundsen sea low, but, is, uh, but neither the atmospheric warning in the peninsula and the sea ice extent decrease in the middle sea sector. And instead, this analysis suggests that the forcing is the main contributor to these uh, long-term changes. However, in our reconstruction, the tropical variability partly explains the year-to-year -year and multidecadal variability. For instance, um, here the figure show the moving 30-year uh, trend uh, for the intertegal Pacific position, IPO, and the Amundsen sea low since um, 8060. And we clearly see that uh, they both st strongly cover. And in addition, our resolution display high cohesion, uh, high cohesion, yes, between the IPO and the ISL at the interannual time scales. And it's also the case, uh, for instance, for the, the CX ten in the weather sea sector. So in conclusion, Albeit tropical variability is not the main driver of the 20th century changes uh, on the surface for the West Antarctic sector, tropical variability uh, is a key contributor to the interannual and multilegal variability. And finally, a few words on the, on the ongoing work and uh, future works. First, um, we are actually working with the new database gathering all the available ice core salty records, in particular sulfate and uh, sodium uh, content. And the goal is to include these new records to again um, better reconstruct winds and sea ice cover, as we know that these records are both influenced by sea ice uh, and winds. I also would like to explicitly um, take into account the intermittency of uh, precipitation when uh, I reconstruct the climate, since uh, several studies over the past year have highlighted that ice core record may be uh, only representative of a few events. And so ice core record may be not representative of climate condition all or along the year. And more linked with the instance or purpose, we are working uh, uh, with uh, Zik and Wu on assimilating marine uh, proxy. And primary results indicate that there is a consistency between oceanic and uh, continental variability. And therefore, this could indicate that uh, the ocean play a substantial role in the continental variability. And lastly, my uh, personal ultimate goal is to reconstruct uh, shell melt weights of the last uh, century, especially in the West Antarctic sector, so Ross, Bellingosen, Amundsen, and Weddell, by forcing a notion sea uh, ice model that explicitly simulates the oceanic circulation in shell cavities. And so we will, the, the plan is to force this model with our paleoclimate atmospheric analysis. This will allow us to better understand the mechanism uh, governing the long-term viability of um, ice shelf melting. I have done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you. Um, well, that was really interesting to see. I mean, obviously a lot of it been, been great to see and to work on, but it's really nice to see some of the new stuff as well. And obviously I'm always really pleased when I see the ice core data being being incorporated. Um, mm -hmm. would, I'd like to just open up and if anyone has any questions, as it's quite a small group, feel free to just sort of put your camera on. I can see everybody on the screen, put your camera on and ask a question or raise your hand if you prefer to do it that way. Yeah, Alessandro, go ahead. Hi, Quentin. Very nice talk. Thanks. Thanks for it. Um, 
I was wondering, can you tell us a bit more about the deepening of the Amundsen and Silow? Um, so you think is connected to anthropogenic forcing, I guess, over the yes. past century. Can you tell us a bit more about the mechanism? What could it be? Yes, yeah, so it's interesting because I, uh, we uh, submitted um, a paper now uh, one month ago. Uh, we applied detection and attribution uh, algorithm on the Amundsen the and Silo, so my resolution. And uh, results show that um, the ozone depression, but also the green oxygenosis, are the main uh, driver of the MNC, uh, of the deepening of the MNC and silo. So I think that the mechanism, the mechanism uh, behind um, the ozone depression is not very clear for the MNC and silo, but for green oxygenosis, it's really linked to. Uh, to increase um, the the gradient between uh, the sea level sea level pressure gradient between the mid altitude and the uh, the high altitude of the the southern hemisphere, and yes, that's my uh, that's my opinion on that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I was thinking also. I've, I've read some papers that were suggesting a more negative IPO during the 20th century. Yes. Uh, but maybe no, you don't think it's, it's that, right? Yeah, IPO could explain uh, some um, changes, but not at the century scale, but only at the material scale, because you had the association like for, uh, I think IPO is a 30 year association. So it might explain why you have a deepening, but at the moment, uh, the IPO is reversed. So it cannot explain the long-term changes in the MSN silo. But to me, so the first thing is the main driver, but you also have the, the tropical variety that can be, um, to that, that is added to the long-term changes, which, which, which was the case um, for, for the end of the 20th century, I think. It's yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any more questions? No. Everyone's quite quite quiet this morning. Um. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. The sort of link with the tropical. Um. Mm -hmm. Because that's always been something, particularly from sort of the ice core yeah. community looking in in West Antarctica. This sort of tropical teleconnections always been there. And there, the, you know, we can kind of see these sort of links between it, but it's yeah. it's useful to kind of be able to separate that out from actually what's sort of background and, like you say, year mm -hmm. to year ability from this sort of longer term um, term trend. So that's really, uh, yeah, I, I think this is a really key thing that the models and this sort of data assimilation mm -hmm. approach is just, is so yeah. good at is actually being able to sort of tease apart and pull those different things um, out. So it was really, yeah, really, really good to see. And I'm really excited to see what the, the next step is going to be when, when you start assimilating some of this chemistry. <laughs> um, is there anybody else who wants to chip in, say hello, join in, or we can open, I can stop the recording as well and open up if anyone wants to just say anything. I'll just pause the recording. And so just say thank you before I stop the recording. Um,